Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me fine? Uh, my name is uh, Ravinder Bala. I'm the mayor of the city of Hoboken. And I just want to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, panel on uh, preparing for climate change. A uh, few uh, sort of public service housekeeping announcements before we get into the thick of our um, esteemed panelists. Uh, I was asked by <coughs> the league to make uh, the following announcement uh, before the start of the session. And that announcement is, uh, the league executive board has asked me to make, to take a moment before we start this educational session to remind everyone, especially the mayors, that your attendance at the league business meeting, the league business meeting on Thursday is important. During the business meeting, your input will help determine the league's leadership for the coming year, as well as the resolutions will guide the league's efforts in the coming year. And mayor's attendance is particularly important since it's the mayor or the registered designee who cast the final vote. If you're not staying at the Sheridan, use the complimentary valet parking. The business meeting will be held on Thursday, November 31st, I'm sorry, 21st, um, that's tomorrow, at 3.30. Uh, 3.30 are going to be refreshments, and then uh, 4 o'clock is the meeting. It's in the Pearl Ballroom on the second level of the Sheraton uh, Convention Center Hotel. Uh, before we, we begin today's program, please turn off your cell phones, includes myself, uh, your beepers, on vi put your beepers on vibration mode during the entire session. Thank you. Um, also, just another announcement, um, everyone's sca uh, scanning for continuing education units, CEUs, or just to verify your attendance of the session, uh, must scan in at the beginning of this program and scan out at the end of the program in order to receive your certificate. To get your printed certificate of attendance, follow the directions found on the CEU procedures section of the printed con conference program handbook. If you have any other questions, please consult the league staff at the, at the information booth on level two. All right, got all that out of the way. So with that, I just want to welcome everyone here to this um, important session on, pre on preparing for climate change. We have um, a number of uh, distinguished speakers um, I, as the, the as mayor of the city of Hoboken, um, you know, I'm very proud that our municipality in Hoboken has um, taken this uh, topic very seriously uh, as a coastal community that was severely impacted by Hurricane Sandy um, in the two years of my administration uh, with the help of uh, our chief sustainability officer, uh, Director Jennifer Gonzalez, as well as um, our chief resiliency officer, Caleb Stratton, um, our Director of Transportation and Parking, uh, Ryan Sharp, and many others uh, developed uh, a climate action plan, um, which is comprehensive and can be viewed on our website. Um, also of note, this year in Hoboken, uh, this is the first year that we are relying upon um, re renewable energy for 100% of our use of electricity at all municipal buildings. And, and uh, we, we um, uh, hope uh, market conditions um, dependent to make that available uh, to, to residents citywide next year as well. Um, we're also implementing something called Rebuild by Design. It's a quarter billion dollar uh, comprehensive flood protection program that's meant to sort of break that cycle that we see in coastal communities of, of destruction and rebuilding and destruction and rebuilding um, by really protecting us from uh, the coastal uh, uh, rising sea levels that we experienced during Hurricane Sandy. That's a, a federally funded quarter billion dollar project that is in the works and um, it's critical to, to Hoboken's future for generations to come. And last but not least, we're trying to integrate uh, transportation into our climate action plan by identifying more environmentally friendly means of uh, micro mobility. Uh, you might have heard of uh, e scooters, which are uh, very popular in Hoboken. They offer a quick, cheap, and environmentally efficient and uh, friendly way to get from one place to another. So with that said, 
Uh, we've got a lot to cover. Um, I would like to introduce um, our first speaker, and uh, she is Natalie uh, Augusto Filion. She is the Chief Sustainability Officer of the City of uh, Newark. Natalie? Thank you, Mayor Bala, and um, thanks to Sustainable Jersey for helping pull together this session. Can I get um, one, five, five minutes left? I want to have three minutes left in terms of timekeeping. Okay. Um, so I wanted to start by offering a uh, little bit of a context setting for the work that's happening in Newark, and in particular my role there. I suggest that because there are very few folks with my title and my position in the state of New Jersey. That doesn't mean that there's not someone who's already kind of doing this work in your municipalities without the title, because that's generally how this works. Can everyone hear me okay? Not, not well. Okay. Can we turn it up, anyone who has AV powers? Just hold it. Hold it closer. Is that better? Oh, okay. That's annoying. Um, I'm just going to lean into it because I'm actually holding my phone for notes. Um, so my name is Natalie Augusto Filion. I serve as the city's chief sustainability officer. And in that capacity, my role is twofold. The first is that I work under the direction of the mayor and our business administrator to advance um, coordination between our departments on sustainability initiatives. So coordination is the low bar. Collaboration is the high bar. I think we all know how hard it is to break uh, beyond our silos. The second piece of my role is that I serve as a kind of first port of entry, as it were, to uh, environmental stakeholders of all kinds. So that includes um, constituents who are calling with complaints about and some kind of environmental issue. Uh, you know, my neighbor's tree branches coming into my uh, backyard uh, and then directing them appropriately. Um, and it also means, you know, fielding calls from potential um, vendors or consultants of environmental services um, and opportunities for collaboration with academic institutions, with um, philanthropic partners, um, and with my counterparts across the country who are trying to uh, advance this work. And um, I like to usually start with a little bit of a background uh, on me. Uh, because I think that it's, uh, it's, it's become a practice that I do at any conference opportunity that I have. I was born in the Dominican Republic and I came to the States when I was three. I grew up in New York City um, and in, in the Bronx. Uh, I am within this body a, uh, a visible representation of somebody who has benefited from efforts to diversify the environmental movement. It is something I'm very passionate about and I bring that to my work um, front and center. Uh, I went on to study the environment in a majority white institution, which meant that I had a lot of challenges doing that work because for uh, black and brown folks, generally speaking, when we talk about environmental issues, it's quality of life and it's health, it's livelihoods, it's well-being, and often the way the work is framed in academic settings is that it has to do with um, only the priorities of, of the affluent or folks that have a voice or power to care about things like climate change. I'm here to tell you that's not true. Uh, don't let anyone tell you that that's true. Um, we care about these issues. Uh, people like myself and folks in my community uh, care about these issues because it, it represents you know, health and safety and, and long-term uh, sustainability of this planet. And I think in, in a context like Newark, which has so many uh, immigrant families, it, it touches very close to home. When uh, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, there was a lot of displaced folks, an unknown number of which are living in our households, right? So we think about this global issue as really interconnected. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that often folks that have this kind of title, uh, we know from surveys that uh, are, are done across the country, are generally um, affluent and white. And so making space for the voices that um, are doing this work already, even if they don't call it climate change or sustainability, is incredibly important. Um, so I want to give a little bit of the history and context of how Newark has been doing this kind of work and the phases or kind of evolution of that work because I think all of us are at different phases of that evolution and it, it, I think of it in three sort of phases. There's the first piece which is who are we and what are we doing, right? It's sort of a visioning exercise, it's a identification of stakeholders, it's a practice of together coming up with priority issues. And for that, for us, that was a little over 10 years ago when we convened a Green Future Summit, we convened working groups, um, and we uh, looked, to, uh, looked forward to creating um, our top priorities. 
And then there's this exercise for students of climate change, like myself, folks that, that studied it in college, where you sort of say, OK, you have to start this way, because that's the right way to start. Uh, well, again, I'm here to tell you from <laughs> work that I have also been in very close contact with sustainability directors across the country. Eventually, you have to just start. Right? You have to identify what the primary, uh, primary opportunities are, what your quick wins are, and how you're also looking to long term. And so for us, that happened around 2011, 2013, when we established our first sustainability action plan. And while there's a lot in that plan that I don't have enough time to get into here, I want to call out something about our, um, our foundational sort of operating uh, framework, our policy framework for this work. We knew that we were hitting our goals if we were uh, improving public health, if we were generating cost savings for the city, the municipality itself, if we were improving the quality of life of our residents um, and of those stakeholders in our community, and also if we were creating opportunities for our residents and our businesses to benefit from the green economy. Um, so uh, I started in my position about three years ago, and I benefited from uh, folks that had roles like mine for you know from 28, 2008, uh, 2009 forward, and um, I was uh, granted the opportunity by Mayor Baraka to basically try and start to mainstream that work. And so while previously people in my kind of position had been placed within departments to do that work within their specific sort of like core service areas, core service delivery area, um, my task was to sort of bring that across departmental um, functions. And at that point, we were about 10 years out from having planned our first sustainability action plan, um, our very first sort of convening. Um, and so it made sense to engage community again and double down on our commitments to that policy framework that I mentioned, but also to kind of taking taking a, a, a step back to understand the vantage point we were operating from. How am I doing this? Okay. <laughs> um, and so what we ended up with was a uh, sustainability action plan with a 2020 implementation horizon. We decided to sort of bring our implementation horizon much smaller. Um, and we also uh, created a very, uh, uh, with a lot of intentionality around education because this word sustainability meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And to some people, it meant a lot of nothing, right? It didn't mean anything specific until you started getting to a conversation. And so we talk about sustainability in Newark as creating a cleaner, greener, healthier, more prepared for the impacts of climate change, and better engaged with green economic opportunities. That's the sort of high level uh, vision that we're operating towards in Newark. And. Um, I'll, I'll zero down on the prepared chapter, which is really our work around climate, um, to say that what we're doing now, what we're trying to focus on now, is obviously the implementation of that work and all different kinds of manifestations. But in particular, I want to call out the need for collaboration and connection across our municipal boundaries in order to have broader impact. Um, and I, I say that because you'll have an opportunity to hear from other municipalities that are, have developed a climate action plan. That's something that I'm actually doing next year. Um, I have gone through a much more intentional um, uh, outset planning process that we're still about to do, right? We're, t we're 10 years into this work and we don't have a climate action plan per se, right? That's not to say that we're not doing the work, but rather that it hasn't been um, uh, brought together under that umbrella. But what is really critical at this juncture where we are in almost 2020, for those of you who've been doing this kind of work for a long time, and remember 2020 is a future milestone, um, we, we need to be really reaching across the municipal boundaries and, and even the state boundaries to speak with a, a, a unified voice about the urgency of the problem and the need for collaboration. Um, so if anyone was here in the session that happened in this room just before uh, this one started, uh, we learned that uh, the Sustainable Essex Alliance, which is a hub that was created by Sustainable Jersey, was, was um, awarded yesterday, given accolades for their leadership in multi-jurisdictional collaboration. Um, that same hub created an opportunity for uh, the city of Newark, the city of Irving, Irvington, and, and a couple of the oranges to get together to advance 
outreach and um, effectiveness of outreach, particularly in other languages, around comfort partners. So folks who may have some familiarity with that, that's a societal benefits charge funded program to ensure that um, low-income households and anyone that is already receiving some kind of um, services to support the cost of their uh, utility bill or other such programs, LIHEAP, et cetera, um, have access to a uh, funding incentive to actually better the performance of their homes. Uh, what we know in Newark is that uh, the majority of folks that are the most burdened by energy costs are also the folks that are living in the worst housing conditions because of age, because of any number of things. Um, and so Comfort Partners is an opportunity to do the, just that, but where there's no language group access. There's no intentionality about bringing those updates to our faith community. Uh, Etc. So that's an, an example of how we're sort of taking this idea of climate planning and working together to maximize our impact by sort of leaning on each other's resources. Another example of that is a Resilient NJ project, which is a, a DEP. Um, it was a from the Community Development Block Grant disaster relief funds that came post Sandy. Uh, which we just celebrated, I think it was the 12th anniversary. Celebration is not the word for that, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, there was, uh, there continues to be a few additional grant dollars to sort of do some intentional planning around resiliency, uh, looking forward into how to rebuild stronger and not just sort of recover back to the same conditions that we were before. I think Hoboken is a wonderful example of being very intentional in looking to that sort of um, stronger uh, transition. And so that's some work that we're doing through uh, through that funded project. So the Resilient and J partners for um, North Jersey include Jer City of Jersey City as a prime, City of Ho Hoboken, the City of Bayonne, and the City of Newark working in partnership with our counties. Um, another one that I'll note because it's sort of interesting is that our um, regional uh, energy provider, uh, PJM, uh, is going through some leadership change. In fact, they just announced a new executive director. And our chief of energy and environment um, has been involved in a multi-state, multi-city conversation across that region um, to think about how to better advocate. At the end of the day, the success of this kind of program around renewable energy depends on the prices that are set at a regional level that's outside of our local control. And so again, unifying that voice and making sure that cities together are using the power of the bully pulpit that mayors have access to to say no you know we really do want to plan for climate change we really do want to be engaged and the last example of that I think is climate mayors so if your mayors has not yet signed up to be part of climate mayors I really encourage you to do so in addition to speaking with that unified voice it provides a platform for shared um, shared cost savings so an example is the electric vehicle uh, request for information that was put out by climate mayors and instigated a, uh, a large sort of market response to not just the vehicles that could be replaced by the city of Newark by 2020, but the vehicles that can be replaced by over 200 municipalities across the country in that same time frame, right? So I will um, wrap because I know that there's lots to say here, but I just wanted to sort of close by, by offering that um, what we're seeing is best practice that is emerging across the country and municipalities that are, you know, in the millions and much better, able, much more staffing, et cetera, is that if we're starting this work now, for those of us who are in that position of sort of doing the planning today, um, we're really trying to look for solutions that cross the climate mitigation, which is to say redu reduction of greenhouse gases, climate adaptation, which is to say the um, preparing our municipalities for the impacts that we know are coming, more rain, more heat, um, as well as the equity opportunities, that idea of a just transition. And I kind of bring that back around to my own life story here because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I do this work and I bring this passion to, the, to this work precisely because I know that planning for climate change and becoming more sustainable communities is a way to undo, undo a number of past harms that uh, have been suffered by, by people of color, by low-income communities, by folks without that political voice. Um, and so that's, that's um, sort of an, an example that I offer to you that we're hearing from all of the leader countries, uh, all of the leader cities across the country. That if we're not working in that nexus, we're really missing an opportunity to both reduce the source of the problem, which is our, our global, global warming um, 
global greenhouse gas emissions, to better prepare ourselves for what we know is coming down the pike, and also to make living conditions for those who most need it improved. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, Natalie. I, I, I'm hopeful that um, we can work with um, uh, Newark in, in uh, the coming years. Um, you know, wh one one of the comments that um, Natalie makes that's really pertinent uh, that I that resonated with me was the intersection between environmental justice and racial justice, and that that was um, a profound impact from Superstorm Sandy, where the most heavily impacted residents were of um, uh, low socioeconomic backgrounds and uh, minority impacted communities. They suffered the most um, through that um, uh, severe weather event. So we've integrated in Rebuild but by Design that very, that very element of environmental justice as well. Um, our next speaker is gonna be Nancy Quirk. Uh, she is the Energy Program Manager of Sustainable New Jersey. Nancy is also gonna walk us through some uh, slides um, that explain um, <coughs> some of the elements of uh, their um, energy program. Uh, so, uh, Nancy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I learned earlier I have to hold this microphone a little closer. So just very briefly, I know many of you are in Sustainable Jersey, uh, and, and the setup has just been perfect. So. Um, just a, a quick overview of who we are. We are that organization here in New Jersey that kind of accomplishes what Natalie was talking about with these national leaders. We bring you all together. We bring municipalities together. About 80% of the municipalities in New Jersey participate in our program. Uh, we provide grants, trainings, webinars, sessions like this that, that let, you know, all the participating municipalities actually speak to their experience because you're the ones who actually do it and, and know the ins and outs and challenges. So very quickly, we're represented around the state. Uh, we also have a schools program. We encourage municipalities to collaborate with the school in their area. Uh, there are a lot of activities you can do together, and if your school's not in the program, you, if you have a green team or participating, you can help hold their hand and get them started. There's, there's a lot of great benefits here. And just one other slide, the way Sustainable Jersey does its work, uh, in addition to bringing everyone together for sessions like this and bringing our resources out to you, offering grants, we create what we call actions. And those are guidance documents that try to capture best practices from exactly the kinds of things we're going to hear from the speakers today. And I'm not going to go through all of these. Natalie just set it up perfectly. The actions, these are guidance documents that give you step-by-step -step guidance, links to resources on how to prepare. So to reduce that risk, urban heat island uh, assessment, uh, green infrastructure planning, all of the tools that you might need to do this planning and then many of the tools you would need for the mitigation to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. And we have someone here uh, from the BPU who will talk about a number of their programs that actually help you, you know, move toward energy efficiency, renewable energy. Natalie hit right on the, the nail on the head with alternative fuel vehicles. I really won't say much more than just to introduce you to our program if you're not in it. We have just a fabulous group of of folks in the program and sharing their experience. And our program is really not possible without the fantastic support of, of all of our funders, our grant program underwriters, our program underwriters. So if you're in the room and are interested in getting involved that way, we do appreciate all of that support. And I can turn it right back over to um, Mayor. Thank you. Great, Th uh, thank you, Nancy. and. Uh, Thank you to um, Sustainable uh, New, Jer New Jersey. They're kind of the, the glue that binds us all together and um, incredible resource uh, for uh, every municipality in, in New Jersey. Um, our next speaker, and I want you guys to stay focused and pay attention because we're going to have a question and answer period uh, after this. So I'm um, looking forward to, to your questions um, within the 12 o'clock deadline, I've been told. Uh, but our next um, speaker, his name is Walter Lane. Um, Walter is the uh, director of planning for Somerset County. 
Uh, Walter? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm Walt Land, Director of Planning. Um, I've been at the county since 1997. I started as an intern and worked my way up through the organization. And I tell that because I've stayed at the county because the freeholders and the planning board have been such strong supporters of planning and allow us as staff to work on a wide range of issues and really be proactive and leading of the pack, so to speak, for planning. So it's been an awesome place to work over the years. So through their leadership, we're able to, able to do a lot of this work. So, um, and part of our tagline is making vibrant connections. And that's how really we're able to achieve a lot of the successes that we've had over the years is because we partner with a wide range of agencies. We partner with all of our towns. We partner with the nonprofit community, regional partners like the NJTPA, the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority, Regional Plan Association, various state agencies to help move um, local priorities and county priorities along. So um, as part of that effort, in 2014, we adopted the Somerset County, master, uh, part of the master plan, our county investment framework. And this is built off the state plan, local plans, and county plans, and other regional plans to clearly articulate where growth and preservation should occur throughout the county. So we have designated growth areas, and more than half the county is shown as a preservation area. Now, we're not going to be able to preserve everything in that preservation area, but we talk about stewardship and environmental restoration in those areas. So, in order, so that was adopted as part of the master plan in, in April 2014, and really to make sure that becomes implemented, we worked with our towns through a series of projects. The first set of being is our supporting priority investment in Somerset County. So as part of that, we received working with the Somerset County Business Partnership, which is our Chamber of Commerce, and it's a, actually a public-private partnership between the county and the chamber, our county economic development offices officer is an executive on loan with that organization, so it is a true public-private partnership dealing with workforce development, economic development, and uh, the typical chamber uh, priorities. To develop the comprehensive economic development strategy of defining what the business community needs for private sector investment and job growth in the county. And that is linked, the policies in that plan are linked to the county investment framework. And then through a series of grants from the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority, close to a million dollars that we received in grants, we undertook um, a series of planning studies, the supporting priority investment work, where we looked at the growth areas in the county, working with each of our towns on identifying alternative land use and transportation scenarios based on market conditions and other factors of what could happen in those areas to promote additional investment and, and development in the county. Um, so, like I said, so we worked very closely with each of our communities that were participating in that work and looked at what existing zoning would allow and then other some smart growth planning scenarios and left it up to them on how they would implement that. But the idea was looking at these, looking, bringing this planning um, expertise from the outside in, looking at those alternatives, uh, give them opportunities for how they can update their master plans or their zoning ordinances based on that and, look, and do a kind of what if planning scenario without using their own resources. So um, this is an example. So that's one scenario in, in the borough of Raritan where we looked at a redevelopment of a, a vacant or underutilized shopping center that's along the Raritan River, which is one of the county's primary greenway corridors, and looked at how we could become more resilient um, and move development out of the floodplain, so reducing risk to, to riverine flooding and climate change impacts, but also promote green infrastructure and renewable energy as part of the development scenario. So the developer, if they implemented green infrastructure, could potentially get a, a, a boost in density for that site for implementing those strategies. And the uh, borough of Manville on the, on the right, we looked at um, a concept they were looking at was taking the Lost Valley, which is an area that's severely been impacted over the years by flooding, where there's been buyouts of uh, about over 100 homes in that area. And we worked with them to develop the Lost Valley Nature Park plan which looked at how to restore the floodplain, green infrastructure, um, trails, and some path passive recreation opportunities. So that was included in our supporting private investment work, and I'm proud to say that they were able to receive a transportation alternative grant for $800,000 from the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority, DOT, to implement the, the beginning of that work. So really, we have focused over the years on doing plans, but actually how, implementing the plan. So it's great if the plan is done, but if it sits on the shelf and not used, we're not really providing value, and it's been my mission as directors to make sure 
that all the work that we do is providing value to our towns, to our taxpayers as we move forward and actually you know, looking for implementation opportunities. So um, as part of that work, we also developed uh, this Planning for Resiliency, or Resilient Communities um, Toolkit, which lists a whole host of things. I'm not going to read through them, but all those different strategies and gave the towns examples of how those could be applied at the local level. As I said, in those redevelopment scenarios and, and smart growth scenarios that we developed, some of them had renewable energy and creating of pocket parks and those types of strategies, and this kind of gives them the detail and when they consider um, updating their master plans or their zoning ordinances, taking those um, strategies and, and implementing them. So we also are uh, working very closely with our Office of Emergency Management. Um, we co-managed the update of the county's hazard mitigation plan. The planning division, this is the third iteration of the county uh, with the hazard mitigation plan. The planning division's always been involved, but this time we've been a co-partner with the Office of Emergency Management. We have an excellent uh, relationship with them. And really what we did is focused on the land use uh, strategies to link land use decisions to hazard mitigation opportunities. So it provides the framework to coordinate uh, mitigation planning efforts at the county level working with our towns, but it also advances the implementation of the investment framework where we've identified greenway corridors for preservation along river uh, corridors and such. Um, it also is unique, we developed a flood resiliency framework and an energy resiliency framework, learning the lessons from Hurricane Sandy that impacted the county. We had a lot of power outages and issues with that. So how, what strategies the county could undertake, what strategies the towns could undertake, and, and then uh, what we could advocate at the state and regional level for improvements to make the county more resilient. So these are more of white papers that identify a, and really a toolkit for different strategies to address these issues. And uh, later this year, well, really early next year, we're going to start working with um, and adopt or working to refine those and make them with the ultimate goal of adopting them as elements of the county master plan to really give that regional framework and towns could use the county's work when applying for grants and saying so not only consistent with local plans, but county plans as well. In addition, um, we developed an electric vehicle readiness plan. The Somerset County is unique. In 2008, the Board of Chosen Free Holders formed the Somerset County Energy Council, which is a nonpartisan think tank group that advises the, uh, the Board of Chosen Free Holders on energy and sustainability issues. So they advised us on solar projects uh, that the county undertook, as well as a series of energy audits that we worked with our, the county and, and majority of our towns to identify energy savings improvements that were, were implemented at the local level as well as the county level. But really, the, the EV readiness plan was really looking at how um, actions the county could model for our towns to implement that and be basically do the test case to look at how well the EV vehicles work, how we could implement the charging technology, and start taking away those questions that people have about range anxiety and those issues. So the county's bought four electric vehicles, um, Chevy Bolts off a state contract. We've installed the charging stations. Uh, we just installed a public charging station in Somerville to kind of promote the use of electric vehicles. And then over the next year or so, we're going to be working with our towns and uh, hopefully develop some model ordinances to make towns EV ready. Uh, really, we've just been a clearinghouse and supporting local efforts. You know, through our shared service efforts, we've also um, installed charging stations using county staff for municipalities that received um, EV charging station grants from DEP and the, uh, the VW settlement. So this is just a, a very brief, high-level overview of a lot of the stuff that the county planning division done, and many other counties um, are doing similar initiatives. I also have the, uh, the fortune of being on the executive committee of the New Jersey County Planners Association, and really county planning uh, agencies really have a lot of resources that can help the towns undertake um, sustainability and resiliency um, efforts at the local level and really are, are a resource that's sometimes underused uh, throughout the state. Um, with that, so that is a very high level uh, mm -hmm. overview of what I did. I think hopefully I'm done with my seven minutes, so <laughs> I could talk for hours about this work. But, uh, thank you. Uh, apologies for limiting uh, to seven minutes. We're trying to get through all the speakers and then um, some Q and A. It's it's a it's remarkable. I think uh, that Somerset has created a county. Um, a master plan, and it's uh, something that we can all think about at the county level. Um, I, I think about Hudson County. Sometimes 
in Hudson County, it's hard for us to agree on the time of day, much less uh, creating a, a, a county master plan. So we might have a relatively harder challenge than other counties, but it's it's a model uh, what we see in Sunbrook County, what they've done uh, at the county level. So we're going to go into our next speaker or speakers. Um, I want to introduce um, our next speakers today. They are Christine Symington, Program Director of Sustainable Princeton, and Robert Gregory, the Director of the Department of Emergency and Safety Services of Princeton. Uh, Christine and Gregory? Sure. Okay. Okay, one more. one more. Boom. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. So, our mantra in, in emergency response. So I'm going to give you a perspective from a first responder and emergency management on climate change and the effects it has on us, the community, and what we're doing in Princeton to combat the issue. So, it's a little harsh, but for most first responders, if you talk to them, they're going to tell you, I don't care. I don't care about climate change. I'm stuck there out on the street, street so I'm going to prepare right, for the worst and hope for the best to happen. But we kind of want to change that. right? We want to educate. Education is one of the best things we can do. In the state, fire prevention has come a long way, and we've done great work with housing code enforcement, fire code enforcement to prevent fires. Although we can't stop the weather, right? we can do things like you're hearing up here from all these uh, very intelligent people on how we can right, reverse the effects of climate change all right, and kind of slow this down. So with that, how does climate change affect us? Well, everybody pretty much uh, knows what these things are. And although we don't have many wildfires in Princeton, when it rains, we flood. Uh, the other thing that really makes you scratch your head is recently we've had some storms come through and they went through Hopewell and knocked out 2,500 homes with power. Uh, one storm came through and stayed on the East Windsor side of Route 130 and never came to the other side. And it leaves you wondering, why does this happen? Like, what's happening out there, right? People ask the question. So we're trying to answer that question. And we're trying to help reduce the effects. And I'm telling you, if you go to the bottom, right, evacuations, damage to our infrastructure, and it strains, budget. it strains budgets, right? When we respond to these, we need more resources, we need more equipment, more training, uh, so it does have a cumulative effect on everyone. So what can we do? Uh, in emergency management, right, those are the four things we live by, right? We plan, uh, we plan for the respond, we mitigate, and mitigation is, is big in this. It's, you can, when you rebuild, when you go to uh, recovery or you're uh, renovating, building, right, all these great ideas, which I won't rehash, but all the green codes and doing the things we can do to make our buildings energy efficient will help, right? That's mitigation. Uh, and, they, and in the end, that helps us recover quicker when we have uh, weather emergencies. But one of the biggest things you could do is, right, build strategic partnerships, right, and help overcome the barriers. Start talking to each other. Because um, in my last slide here, uh, what I'll go through is what we're doing in Princeton and how we've basically done that. We basically engaged not only just our municipal employees, but also our community, universities, the public. And Christine, who's going to come up here next, and her staff did a wonderful job of pulling together a climate action team, writing a climate action plan. I was on the resiliency part of it and uh, we had working groups and so out of that we've developed a climate action a climate hazard action plan it's an annex to our emergency operations plan so emergency operations plan right it's a kind of a um, who's in charge who's what are the lines of responsibilities well the climate action hazard annex is basically a blueprint for what we're going to do to kind of combat climate change and from that, the next step is creating a flood hazard annex. Um, so one of the unique things in Princeton, like I said, when it rains, we become an island. And if you wonder what floods in Princeton, you have to reach out to certain people, which we realized when we were in this committee was a problem. 
Like what happens when those people decide to, you know, venture off into the sunset? So we're starting to do our planning, we're starting to write plans, we're including that, and we're also looking at solutions, right? So, and the solutions to me are band-aids. We're responders, we need certain things to overcome when roads, floods, and things happen. But we're also going further with the climate action plan of, okay, what do we do to kind of reduce the effects, right, and reverse these effects? Um, and so one of the biggest things we did was build bridges. Um, all those agencies, myself with sustainability, engineering, health and human services, and our uh, Access Princeton are really uh, working well together to um, make this happen. And one of the things that um, we're currently working on, we're about 90% there, that I think is a real, going to be a real success story, is we've developed our own Princeton Prepares. So it's an outreach to the community for people who want to tell us, hey, I have an issue, I need help with evacuation, you know, I have, I want to get reminders, so if something's on the horizon, I can make sure I have medications. So we developed our own um, system, and, you know, we've uh, also involved, uh, got into what we call a buddy system, where if individuals who live in town, but their family may be, you know, further away, do they want someone to check in on them so they can have a neighborhood kind of uh, uh, buddy system is what it's called. And then the last thing we're bringing into that is the Blue Angel program. Our police have that, and it kind of re-energize them. So people that want to put a lockbox on the house with a key, so if emergency services need to get in, we do that. But the great thing about the program is it's uh, one to two page form, and we collect that data, and we'll get it into our police dispatch so that when we're going to a call, we know what's happening. So. It's a good thing, it's a good outreach to our community, and it's all kind of grown out of uh, the planning and work that all the people have been doing in town. So it's a great success. And uh, with that, I will let Christine come up and give you the details. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Mayor Bala, and to Sustainable Jersey for asking Princeton to come and present um, the work we've been doing in our town with respect to climate, climate change. Um, as Bob mentioned, he was part of a working group of a climate action plan. Um, I'm the program director at Sustainable Princeton, and Sustainable Princeton is a nonprofit that works very closely with the municipality and its departments and the board's committees and commissions. And um, in 2017, our mayor and council put on their goals and priorities to make a climate action plan for the town, for the community. So Sustainable Princeton um, took that on and went out and received a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, to develop the plan. So we were, you know, we scheduled the meetings, we organized the working groups, we um, uh, scheduled outreach sessions, um, <clears throat> and we did a lot of preparation work by looking around the country and from other cities in New Jersey, like Newark, like Hoboken, um, who were really on the forefront of some of the, the storms in, in New Jersey as a result of climate change, <clears throat> and looked at what they'd been doing and tried to learn some of the best practices to incorporate them into the plan. So <clears throat> the, the actions in our plan look very similar to some of the things that you're doing in Somerset County, some of the things that Natalie mentioned. Um, you know, with microgrids, electric vehicles, better uh, storm preparedness, green infrastructure. Um, so it's not so much of what's in the plan that's very, very important, but what we've really tried to focus on during the development of the plan is the process. And um, you, someone mentioned about a plan sitting on a shelf. And so at the start of this, we, we really were thinking very carefully about how do we make sure that doesn't happen? How do we make sure that this plan just doesn't get written during, you know, while everyone's really engaged, and then it goes and sits on a shelf. So, one, we tried to make sure people understood the human impacts of climate change. So, at the forefront of our plan are the specific impacts of climate change in Princeton. And then we set about with these working groups. We had five working groups. I'm going to go in more detail about the resiliency working group, which Bob was a member of. 
Um, but we made sure that there were people involved in those working groups um, that so we would create short, a, a shared ownership feeling. Um, there are people here from Princeton in the audience, so I want them to raise their hands because they were on the working groups. Tay Jal from engineering, Louise, who uh, works at NGA Future, but she's also on her planning board. Of course, Mayor Lempert, who is one of the sponsors of this. Zena Tekjarni, who works for Sustainable Jersey, is on our planning board and is also liaison on the Environmental Commission. So we really tried to make sure we were integrating all the boards, committees, and commissions, municipal departments, to put the plan together in the hopes that um, it would increase the probability that the actions would actually come to be. Um, and one of the things when we, would, when we brought the working groups together, as Bob can attest to, is we said, all right, don't think of this as more things to be put on your plate. What are the things that you're already struggling with in your department that when you look at it through the lens of climate changing and the increase of storms and their, and their um, intensity that you wish you could have prioritized through this lens? And Bob said, well, you know, there are a lot of roads that, that flood and we have to spend, our police have to spend time to go out there and put barriers out there. We wish we could have um, job boxes out there with the equipment already out there. Can we put that in the plan? Well, of course, we should put that in the plan as a priority. So if you're working in your communities on trying to put together a climate action plan, that's a really um, helpful approach is, like I said, not to have it be seen as just another plan another set of actions that your departments and your boards, committees, and commissions have to take on, but it's a way to prioritize the things they've already been trying to get done. We also tried to make sure we had broad um, uh, um, representation on the various working groups. On the Resiliency Committee working group, we had our board, head of our Board of Health. We had um, the head of our um, nonprofit volunteer first aid and rescue squad. We had um, our assistant administrator, who was also the health officer for the municipality. We had a resident service coordinator from Princeton Community Housing, which is an affordable housing uh, development in Princeton, um, a member of the planning board, and um, the director of operations from the Princeton First Aid and Rescue Squad. Um, so it sort of turned out that the <coughs> resiliency fell into like sort of three buckets that I'll get to in a second. But as I mentioned, we did a lot of outreach before we started drafting the plan. We had a series of public events called Let's Talk Climate, where we invited people to come and sort of talk about you know, what their concerns are, what were the impacts they were feeling in Princeton. And this is sort of uh, some screen, uh, screen captures or photos of some of these events where we had people write things down. This is sort of an amalgamation of, sort of the, the topics that we heard from people. Um, you know, people are concerned about flooding, you know, they, people brought up microgrids and battery storage. We have a very informed community. Um, talked to, a lot of people talked about the, the trees that come down in these storms and wanting to make sure that they're actually getting replaced. Um, so we, we, we took all this information and we shared this with the steering committee and the working groups. They had a sense of what the community was thinking about and what their concerns were. For each of our um, five action areas, each one has a vision. The vision for the resiliency section is that all Princeton community members are prepared for the impacts of climate change. Within that action, we have three objectives that, as I said earlier, sort of broke into three buckets. The first one has to do with stormwater management to deal better with the increase in flooding that we are experiencing in Princeton. Uh, this is a map of the impervious cover in Princeton. It's um, over 10% of the uh, land in Princeton is covered with impervious cover, and that's growing. Um, so that is obviously contributing to increase in stormwater runoff. So we know that in this section of our plan, we have to do things that are going to reduce this, like um, implementing green infrastructure, um, working to reduce impervious cover through ordinances. As Bob mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, the way Princeton is sort of situated, when it does flood, you can see these, these uh, flood zones, um, it, it disconnects our community from the hospital. It's now across Route 1, um, across uh, an area that floods a lot, so that's a, that's a risk. 
We also have um, in our set of resiliency strategies things that focus on health. One of the reasons Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was interested in funding this, um, this effort was because they recognized the intersection between climate change and health. This is um, a social vulnerability map that shows you, um, you know, where it floods, you know, how is that likely to impact people who are already socially vulnerable in Princeton. This is a heat island map. So we can use this kind of a, a tool or a map to understand, you know, where are there heat islands in our area and, and do a better job of targeting and maybe planting more trees there and other types of infrastructure that can reduce the uh, heat island effect, urban heat island effect. Um, and as I mentioned, we are, we've incorporated a lot of green infrastructure into the actions in the resiliency section. Bob mentioned that one of the other outcomes was a new registry that we're developing. What we uncovered in talking with the resiliency uh, working group is that the existing registry that they had been using, Register Ready, which is some of you might be familiar with, it's a state program, um, just wasn't really sufficient. It wasn't being well utilized. It was a complicated, long, laborious process to, to enter um, your information into the registry, difficult to maintain. Um, so we were also, because we were working on climate change and health, were approached by Pew Charitable Trust and was given a grant, the municipality was given a grant to work on the very set of actions we had already been putting, we already had in our plan. So think of this as another way of, if you're going to go through the effort in your community to develop a climate action plan, that it, it really puts you in a good position to find the funding out there to implement it. If you've shown you've already sort of done this collaboration with the um, various stakeholders that you're ready to go if they were to give you funding. This is a, a little early peek at some of the graphic design that we've been working on for this program. And our intention is to go out to areas in our community where our vulnerable community members exist, have them sign up in the registry, and integrate this within to the police um, computer assisted dispatch system, their CAD system, so that if they get a call or there's a, a, like a storm coming, they can better identify the folks in our community who may require supplemental oxygen or in a wheelchair or have other, some, uh, other, some other type of, uh, of vulnerability. I'll leave you with this. When we started the climate action plan with our first steering committee, one of the members said, you know, if at the end of this we can't fix this, which is a photo of Alexander Road, um, I can't recall if this is Irene or Sandy, it could be any storm these days, um, and someone drove into a flooded, uh, into that flood and, and was stranded, um, that if we can't fix this, then we really, you know, we're not focusing on the right thing. So we hope that at the end of the day, through the process of making sure we included so many people, formed collaborations with departments that we had never really interacted with before that we would really increase our ability of success in actually completing the plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bob and Christine. That was uh, very, very thoughtful. And I also want to acknowledge, thank, and recognize Mayor Liz Lampert for uh, being here. Um, you know, nothing gets done without um, the mayor of the municipality uh, offering that leadership from top down. So we appreciate your efforts, uh, Mayor. Um, our final speaker today is Sarah Bloom. Uh, Sarah is the director of the Office of Clean Energy of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities. Uh, Sarah. Thank you. Good morning. How many of you have electric or gas bills? <laughs> All right, I got a program for you. So my name is Sarah Bloom, and I do have the privilege of having one of the best jobs in state government. Um, for almost now two years, Governor Murphy has been embarking upon a clean energy future, and a lot of that work is originating in my office. We are working on um, resiliency in many different ways through microgrids, energy storage, electric vehicles offshore wind, solar, energy efficiency, but one of the things that has been the cornerstone of our office has been the clean energy program. And for those of you who are 
getting those bills from our investor-owned utilities. One of those charges on there is the societal benefits charge. And it goes to fund the clean energy program. And within that program, we have energy efficiency for all different types of things. But we also do a lot of other programs too. And I encourage you to stop by our booth. We are at 1429. I have a whole outreach team there. And we also come out and we do site visits. We do community engagement. If you're having fairs or if you want us to come to a program at your library, we're more than willing to come out and talk about all the different things that we have available. And I think you've heard a little bit about it earlier too. We have Comfort Partners, which is our income eligible weatherization program. We are kicking off a food bank outreach program this December in which we're handing out LED light bulbs and assistance for low income folks with information. Um, but we also do your local government energy audits where we provide up to $100,000 worth of energy audit services for free for our government and nonprofit partners. And there's a great uh, brochure, I have a couple of them, that has everything within it. Um, and we're really trying to help uh, move forward a lot of Governor Murphy's policy goals. We are on a path to 100% clean energy by 2050. And yesterday I had the privilege to be there as the governor increased our offshore wind goals to 7,500 megawatts by 2035. And it's exciting to be down here today um, and be able to share that with all of you. As you know, I woke up this morning and saw the five windmills turning, so that's always happy too. Um, oh, I think I hit something on here. So, uh, And we are looking forward at how we can be engaging everybody and how we can all be marching on this pathway together. And I think a lot of you have been involved in our stakeholdering over the past 18 months. We've been working on the governor's energy master plan as well and how we're going to be moving forward. And one of the things that we've heard as we've been going down the um, energy master plan was how to involve communities further in this pro process. And we've been great partners with Sustainable Jersey for the past 10 years and know all the great work that's been going on in the communities. But one of the things that we had heard feedback was that um, our environmental justice communities were looking for different ways to engage and also recognizing that there's not always money available for the planning. And I think we just heard from Princeton too that after you have the plan there seems to be money available but it's not always available to bring folks together. And so one of the things that we have done this year is set up community energy planning grants. And we also have a brochure on that too. So in case uh, you wanna take this back, and we have money available for communities based on your size from five to $25,000. And what we are looking to do is have you partner with those folks within your community so having two different types of government, it could be your county and your town, it could be your town and your school, engaging with a business, with a nonprofit, being able to bring all these folks to the table and start to have some of these conversations and being able to look at where do we want to go with our energy usage, where do we want to go with some of our transportation initiatives, what are we doing planning as a community and how does this tie up into where the state is also going and being able to look at how we can all move forward together and Kathleen Lewis from my team is in the back of the room too and she's more than happy to follow up with you guys on this she also happens to be a councilwoman so she can help you navigate um, and talk your language too but this is one of the things that we are excited about because we look at this as the first step of being able to tie together what the state is doing with what you're doing on the local level but also for towns that may not be able to uh, bring folks together because you don't have the money for the consultant or who just may need the room rental or something like that this is a way to start facilitating those conversations as we're moving forward and being able to chart out that path for all of us going forward. I'll also say too, if you are an urban enterprise zone or an opportunity zone, I have some enhanced incentives there too. So that may be something for you to also take a look at as your town is doing its own planning. On energy resiliency, um, I will say that it saddens me every time I go on Facebook because the board usually has one star. And that's because 
that's usually when people come to the Board of Public Utilities, when your lights aren't on, your cable is out, your phone's not working. And we don't always get to interact with you on the days that everything is working and functioning. So we do have a lot of experience with resiliency, and I think we have also learned a lot of lessons as we try to fulfill our vision and goal to have safe, reliable, affordable service for all the ratepayers of New Jersey. But what we've been doing over the past couple of years is also looking at how can we build in the redundancy and the resiliency to the systems. And we've been looking at microgrids as one of the ways. And a couple of years ago, we had put out a request for town center distributed energy resources. And what that really is, is being able to set up a microgrid where, think of it like a loop, and where in your town would you have that loop of energy so that if other parts of your town went down, that this loop of services would be able to be up and running. Um, some of the towns that submitted were looking at their town hall, a school, police and fire, ways that if something happened to your community, there would still be services available, power flowing. And so this is something that we have been working on and we have moved forward to the next phase of this and also being able to look at what are some of the barriers here are they regulatory are they financial and we received recently from the department of energy a three hundred thousand dollar grant in which we are trying to study what's the best way to move forward with financing of this and being able to create a path forward for other towns besides the 13 that are currently in our process to figure out if this works for you. And we're actually very excited about this too because New Jersey is kind of the testing ground and depending on how it goes here, it's going to be deployed nationally. One of the other things that um, Governor Murphy has done has established goals for us for energy storage. And we are looking at deploying 600 megawatts by 2021 and 2000 megawatts by 2030. And currently the state has about 450 megawatts of storage. But what this is, is allows us to put a battery somewhere so that if something should happen, that we could be able to draw upon that battery power. And looking at how can we be moving forward with this as both a resiliency tool, as well as potentially in the future for being a way to incorporate our renewables as we are moving towards a, a renewable future. And how can we have this so that, again, thinking about planning for the future and as you're designing buildings or as we're moving towards electric vehicles, what are all the different ways that we can be integrating these technologies together? Um, the board had re accepted a report that we had done by Rutgers in June, and now we're starting to look at the proceeding to see what else we need to do in order to move forward our storage goals, what kinds of funding mechanisms do we need to have there. So there's a lot going on, and I am hopeful that you guys are staying involved with us too. Um, one of the other ways to stay involved too is to sign up for our newsletter or our listserv. We are gonna be having a clean energy conference April 6th and 7th, and it's gonna be back here in Atlantic City. There's going to be different tracks and again, actionable items and ways for you to move forward on this, how to use our incentives and be able to pull this all together. And again, I offer up members of my team to come and talk, whether it's to your council, if you want us to come and do a presentation in a library, if you've got a green fair, we are more than willing to come out and be a partner with you. We recognize how important it is that we are all moving forward together and be able to make sure that you're aware of the different resources we have through the clean energy program. So we look forward to engaging with you guys soon. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I think uh, Sarah really um, uh, brought home a, a, an important point. We, at this juncture as municipal officials, have no excuse not to prepare, uh, number one. But the state of New Jersey, uh, through gov the, the Murphy administration, has actually offered us, as uh, Sarah explained, um, a wide array of resources at our disposal. So uh, with that, we'll take any, um, any questions that pe people may have. 
Uh, the microphone is over here, not there. Um, uh, and uh, any questions, feel free to raise your hand and, and uh, come to the microphone. Um, let's see, any questions here? All right, we got one. I have a question, but I'll wait for see if any other. Okay, ma'am, do you want to come to the? Do you want to come to the microphone? Okay, so, so the question was whether or not um, any uh, municipalities have uh, lists of um, what what uh, individual citizens can do in response to uh, uh, climate change um, challenges. Is that is that? Yep. Go ahead. I'm not sure. Oh. You might have to. Uh, uh, yes. So in um, we are working on a sort of summary of the climate action plan, and in it is a list of what you can do. So we took sort of the five sections of the climate action plan and put a list of individual actions that someone could, we, we designed it in a way that hopefully they'll cut it out, put it on the refrigerator and everybody in their family can follow it. Um, and then just yesterday, Sustainable Princeton launched a new website where it's geared towards a resident to say, okay, what can I do? Very similar list of actions in the various topics um, as they um, as it relates to sustainability. I do want to say I was remiss to mention that, you know, Sustainable Jersey has grants also, and there is an action in our plan that is being funded by a Sustainable Jersey grant. So if you're looking for funding to help implement your climate action plans or create one, Sustainable Jersey is also a great source. Yeah, I, I do want to underscore that and, and thank uh, Nancy Quirk for really bringing us together through Sustainable New Jersey. They're an excellent resource. Uh, in Hoboken, we have um, the Green Team, uh, which offers any resident uh, the ability to bring their interest in um, knowledge, value um, on a volunteer basis. And we also have this, the CERT Team, the Community Emergency Response Team, which also um, helps with uh, preparedness um, uh, matters. Uh, Ma'am? Uh, and Julie, Deputy Mayor Cranford, uh, I did want to ask, what was the grant money used for at the beginning of the process? I understand the implementation grant, but the beginning of the process. Um, so uh, the budget was used for coordinating meetings, conference rooms, a food to, so the working groups mostly had to meet during lunchtime, so, you know, to make sure we were being good you know, meeting organizers, hosts. Um, so small budget goes to things like that. Office supplies, graphic designer to develop the, the, the final plan. Um, staff time, personnel time, consultant to help develop the green, uh, greenhouse gas inventory. Um, I'm trying to think other marketing communication buzz budget. So ads in the paper for our public events, things like that are things that I think you would have to think about putting into a budget for a grant to develop a climate action plan. Uh, yeah, uh, did, just come on, come on to the mic. Uh, if you have central application, we can go to get a list of the various funding agencies um, rather than um, for projects. Sure. So the question is, uh, is there a place to go to get a list of the various funding agencies? Um, uh, do you want to sure. address that issue, Sarah? If you come to our website, njcleanenergy.com, uh, you can find all of our different programs, but also for state programs, um, our Economic Development Agency also has funding available too for different projects and we've been coordinating with them on the main streets and urban enterprise and opportunity zones as well but you can find most of it through our website so njcleanenergy.com
Yes, and I wanted to mention that on the Sustainable Jersey website, sustainablejersey.com, we have a grants portal that lists a lot of grants are just announced to us, so you can search on the grants portal. But as I mentioned before, many of our funders are really funding grants that we give out to the community, so it's sort of a pass-through. We have a number of grants that are focused just on energy projects. The Gardner Foundation has been giving us each year where we can award grants for $10,000 or $30,000, and that's for energy projects only. That's a significant <coughs> planning opportunity for you. Uh, and then New Jersey Natural Gas also gives us, during the summer, we get three fellows that we can embed into municipalities or schools that are in New Jersey Natural uh, Gas territory. And, and they're embedded to give you hands-on technical assistance. In fact, a lot of what they do is help get you prepared to apply for the, the funding opportunities that Sarah mentioned at the Clean Energy Program. So our website is also a resource that you can use. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, great. We have uh, about three minutes left. Any any other questions uh, from the audience? All right. If not, I had a question for um, uh, Walter. Uh, county master plan. W what do you do if, if, if uh, every county has a number of municipalities? What do you do if you have a, a, a mayor of a municipality that really couldn't care less about climate change? Uh, doesn't want to invest municipal resources, doesn't want to invest any resources. Um, you know, uh, it's just not a priority. How do you, how do you bring an entire county together a lot, uh, for a common purpose if you don't have buy-in from all the, the various stakeholders? That, that's the last question. Thanks, Mayor. <clears throat> I think it's just really the relationships with the county has developed over the years working with our town. So our investment framework that was a buildup of local plans, county plans, and regional plans. And it was a criteria-based uh, project using the state plan and a whole host of other planning documents. But ultimately, it came down to us having conversations with the town. So if an area met the criteria for being a designated growth area and the town said, we're not interested, it's not shown on the map that way. So there really was true municipal buy-in. It was top-down and bottom-up to come up with that map. So part of it is, is like we, we try to bring the towns along that may have not be as interested by showing the different grant resources and the other technical assistance the county can provide and helping them and, and showing them by participating in these efforts, this town got this grant or this town got that grant and kind of show that by working together and working in partnership and collaborating, you can you achieve these successes. So that's always been my goal as director is when we're showing these planning projects to actually show that real results come out of the work. Otherwise, I'm, I'm burning my planning capital with those communities, and they're not they're going to start walking away and not talking to the county. So my, I'm charged by my freeholders to engage every town in the county that wants to work with us, and then that has helped us bring along other towns that are less likely to be involved over the years. And this is not just my efforts. It's the effort of my predecessor, Bob Bezik. We have a long history in the county of working with our towns, and really that's how we're able to achieve the successes and the results that we have. Great. Well, it's uh, 12 o'clock noon exactly, so uh, that concludes the program. Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating. Appreciate it.